Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today I'm finally gonna explain how VRMs work, and I've done this video way too many times and failed way too many times, so if this is dodgy, well, it's because I've given up on retakes. So, um, VRMs, how do they work? Well, first of all, let's break down what VRM means. So VRM stands for Voltage Regulation Module. Uh, it's an extremely generic term, uh, doesn't really specify much. Uh, however, in computers, there's only really a couple of types of these, and usually when we talk about this, we're referring to the uh, to the voltage regulators that convert your 12 volts DC. That's what comes out of your power supply. That's your main power rail. Um, well, you also get 5 and 3.3. Uh, this is generally used for driving various uh, ICs. Um, this sometimes gets down converted into actual usable uh, power for um, RAM and some other components, but usually it's not used for anything. Uh, and generally, all of your big VRMs will run off of your 12 volt rail. So, uh, you'll have 12 volts and you want to convert it into something that a CPU can actually use, like 1.2 volts. Uh, and for this, you use a type of uh, voltage regulator, and oh, we're in the middle of the page. Oh, whatever. Whee! Let's move to the edge. There we go. So, for this uh, conversion from 12 to 1.2, you usually use a, well, there's several ways to achieve this, but the most efficient way and the way that it's done in computers is to use a DC, uh, is to use a buck converter. So a buck converter is basically a very simple circuit. It looks roughly like this, where uh, we have, well, that'll be your input. You have a switch. And I'm going to draw a switch because A, drawing actual MOSFET uh, symbols is a pain. And because the MOSFETs in, uh, in uh, buck converters are literally only used as switches. So the circuit looks like this. And as you can clearly see, it's really not that complicated. Um, I have two switches and an inductor. And this basically can convert any, uh, any voltage that you apply here. So if we say put 12 volts here, then this goes to ground. That's what the arrow symbol is. That usually means to ground. So that's ground. So if we apply 12 volts here, then we can actually get any voltage below 12 volts right here. Any voltage we want, we can get it below that. Uh, this right here is a choke or inductor. Uh, the distinction between the two being that all chokes are inductors, not all inductors are chokes, because chokes are chokes because of them being inductors used for filtering purposes. So you can use inductors for other things, and then they're not chokes. But in VRMs, they're chokes. So I'm just going to use choke because it actually has more, less letters. I prefer the inductor term because it makes more sense, and it's, uh, it's Googleable, unlike choke. If you try to Google choke, it's kind of uh, it gives you a pretty hard time. Uh, this block right here, that's going to be your load. This can be a CPU, GPU, North Bridge, RAM, whatever. It could be a light bulb. It could be a DC, well, it could really, you wouldn't want to run this on a DC electric motor. Um, actually, yeah, a DC electric motor with no, yeah, that, that could work. So you could totally run an electric motor. Basically anything uh, that you want to power could go right there. So. You go from 12 volts, and by here, if we're going to say this is a CPU, so by here, by this point, because there's, you know, there's nothing between here and here, uh, you're going to have whatever voltage the CPU runs on. Now let's say that's going to be 1.2 volts for today. So we want 1.2 volts for this CPU. So, um, and there's one last component missing in this circuit, and I'm going to explain why that one's there when, uh, actually later, uh, when we, when I fire it up. So let's fire it up. So we've got two switches in here, and everything else is completely passive, right? There's no other components that I can really do anything with. I could close this switch. That doesn't do anything, because this switch is just hooked up to ground and, and, and this, and this is, again, unpowered. There's no power anywhere in the system. So closing this switch doesn't do anything. If I close this switch, then we're going to get something interesting. And we're going to get two graphs here that I'm going to draw. So this right here will be called point A. And that right there is going to be point B, OK? So at the start of time, 
here we have a graph. Ooh, I have an idea. Wait, is that going to work? Oh, no, it's not going to work. Okay, whatever. Um, so I have a, let's have a graph of, say, voltage, right? So um, volts at, and that's going to be at the A point. There. And at the top of this, we're going to have, let's say, no, I'm going to put a line here. I'm going to say that's 12 volts right there. That line right there is 12 volts. That down there is 0 volts. All right, so when I close this switch, then from A to ground, because you always measure your voltage against uh, against ground, or you want you have to measure it against something. There's not just, there's a voltage there. Uh, it doesn't really work like that. Uh, there has to be a difference uh, that from one one area to another. So you have your 12 volts, uh, and we've just closed it. So what you'll see is, and I'll need a different color here, and I just, there we go. So what you'll see is it'll, you know, so, you know, switch closed, we have 0 volts. And when we close the switch, we get 12 at A point, right? So now we have 12 volts on A point. But what do we get on B point? We obviously don't get 12 volts at B point. Well, what we get at B point, let me draw another graph, volts at B is going to look like this. So again, I'm going to put 0 volts down here and 12 volts up there because this one's going to be a bit of a pain. Um, and 12 volts will be this line. There we go. I should have totally enabled a grid for this. Um, and so, you know, if we if we graph the voltage, then for you know this time period right here, it's going to be just flat. It's going to be zero because there's no no power in the circuit, so this is zero. And B point is right after the choke, so it's right after the inductor. Just keep that in mind. So now as time goes on, we eventually switch on 12 volts, but obviously we don't get 12 volts here because that, that, that would destroy the CPU. So we don't get 12 volts right off the bat. What happens is, uh, let me move this out of the way again. Um, so we're going to produce 12 volts for a certain time period, right? So I should have actually specified that there is a time section here. So this is time down here, obviously. So that's time. So that's... And so we have 12 volts turned on for that period of time. And what's going to happen at B point is going to look very interesting. It's going to look like this, OK? Or it could also look like this um, if you have a really, like, it depends on the kind of choke you're using, uh, what you'll actually get in terms of rise. Um, you could also end up with something that looks uh, like this. For example, right, you could get all of those uh, voltage uh, options. All of that could happen in, in this scenario where you keep the switch closed for a certain period of time. But for the sakes of this illustration, let me just undo a bunch of stuff. Uh, I'm going to say we cut off uh, our voltage supply very early. So we reach something like that, right? And they do somewhat align. Okay. So. We reach a certain voltage point, and let's say that is, uh, let's just say that right there is 1.2 volts. Boom. 1.2. So now we've achieved the voltage we want on our CPU. So that, that's great. Uh, and if we, you know, keep this turned on for longer, then, you know, let's say we extend that past that way, then what will happen is this will keep rising linearly, and eventually it'll hit 12 volts. So we'll obviously... At this point, we're going to open the switch. And that's going to, you know, cut off this charging cycle. And now let's talk about what actually happened while the switch was closed. So when I close the switch, I apply 12 volts to the inductor. Now, inductors resist current changes, OK? And they're called inductors because they induce a magnetic field. The magnetic field is responsible for their reluctance to allow currents to change. So the inductor starts building up a magnetic field. 
when the mag while the magnetic field is building up, the voltage there's going to be a voltage drop across the inductor. Now, this voltage drop will be not converted into heat because usually, if you have a component, right, say a resistor, and you have a drop of voltage across the resistor, it's going to convert it straight into heat. Inductors don't do this. There's a voltage cr drop across the inductor, but it's converting all of that energy that's being lost into a magnetic field, and that's going to start expanding as the inductor charges. And as the inductor charges up, uh, the magnetic uh, the voltage, wait, the voltage drop across the inductor gets smaller, which is why our voltage, so at point A, we get, you know, we get whack bang 12 volts right off the bat. But at point B, because the inductor is still charging, you're going to have that slow, you know, rise. And that's going to be tied to how high inductance the inductor is. Very low inductance inductors have better efficiency. Um, because they're smaller, there's lesser eddy currents, you're putting less energy into them and there's dis less discharging, so you know, they're higher efficiency, but they also respond faster. They're gonna chain, like, the lower your inductance, the, the faster that rise time is gonna happen. If there wasn't an inductor, you're, you, you're just gonna get straight 12 volts right off the bat, right? Um, so, inductors basically limit how quickly the voltage can change depending on their inductance, which tells you how big the maximum magnetic field that they can hold basically is. So, we've now built up a magnetic field, right? We've charged up the inductor to the point where A point, uh, I mean B point, is at 1.2 volts. And we don't want to go above 1.2 volts because that's what we want to run the CPU at. And so we have to s turn off this switch. So we open this switch and that's going to mean that at A point, we're going to get this gigantic voltage drop, and that voltage is just going to fall straight into the ground, and it's going to, you know, drop right down. And that's going to cause an issue right now. So this circuit right here is incomplete. I said that earlier. Uh, this is not a complete buck converter. This would not work. This would actually be, ca this would, at this moment, in this state, that like charged, charge an inductor, open all, both switches open, this would be a catastrophic failure state. This would just destroy whatever's inside uh, this right here. And the reason for that is when you, you know, open this switch, uh, you no longer have 12 volts here, right? So you, you have zero volts. And you also lose current flow. So there was current going through the circuit like that, right? It was going from 12 volts to ground and through the inductor and through the load. And this is gonna cause an issue. So that current, was building up that magnetic field inside the inductor. That magnetic field no longer has a current sustaining it. There's no current going through the circuit. So that magnetic field is gonna start to collapse. So all of the energy stored in that magnetic field is gonna be converted into, a, basically, it's gonna try to push a current, okay? Uh, and the thing is, there's no closed circuit here. So this inductor right now is gonna start acting like a battery, essentially. And that's going to mean that this end, B point, is going to fly positive. You're going to get huge positive voltage, and this will start acting like ground. And basically, unless the voltage exceeds the rating of this switch right here and just skips through the switch, uh, this voltage is going to just keep going up and up and up and up. So that's obviously very bad, and even if the voltage spikes a little bit, it's going to destroy your CPU. So we can't let this happen. And unfortunately, human reflexes are slow, but electrical ICs and even MOSFETs are also very, very slow. Inductors do not care for how slow you are. They're not going to wait. They're going to start that voltage spike really, really quick. So you're going to need one more component in this circuit to make it work. And that's going to be a diode in parallel with the uh, switch down here. So there, there's going to be a diode in parallel there. So diodes are cool because they allow current to only flow in one direction. So when we put, tw you know, when we close this switch, there's no problem with a short circuit to ground. There's no short circuit because there's a diode there. It won't let that happen. So the current still has to go through our inductor and our load. So th that, that part of the circuit is working great. Um, but when we open this switch, then we're going to get a positive voltage here, right? That's going to propagate to the diode. Uh, current going this way, the diode's happy with that. So you're going to get current flow through the diode and like that. Now the reason why there's this switch also here is diodes are horrifically inefficient. Just absolutely terrible. The more current you try to push through a diode, the more of it's, it's going to convert into heat. And it, basically anything above an amp is going to massively uh, 
Like, you can't really get a good enough diode for anything above an amp. Uh, sure, you can get 10 diodes and put them all in parallel, but that'll get really, really big really, really quickly. It's not going to be space efficient. There's no way you're going to use that. So you put a switch in parallel with the diode, and basically while once this switch is fully open, right, we know that this one's open because we just opened it, and now it's sitting open, and now we can go and close this one, and the current will go, instead of through the diode, it'll start going through this switch, and we boost our efficiency. Lovely. So now our voltage is going to start dropping because the inductor is discharging just fine, there's free current flow, it's not going to complain. Uh, so our voltage right here is going to start dropping slowly. Right, so it's going to start dropping like that, and I'm sorry, I did not realize my current scale, uh, my graph scales would be this terrible. But you know, uh, if we let the, you know, if we do not apply 12 volts for a long enough period of time, our our voltage is just going to hit rock bottom, and that that's not going to be a good thing. So, actually, that would look more like. Give me a second. That's going to look more like that. Okay, that's what the voltage. It takes a while to get an inductor to fully discharge. So, whereas the charging cycles are much faster. So, this is going to take very, very long, but we're going to lose voltage, right? The, the voltage is going to go out of spec. It's going to go too low and the CPU stops working. It doesn't blow the CPU up, it just stops working. And I don't know about you guys, but I'd like if my CPU was running. So, what you do, because there's not really much you can do, is you open this switch, so that puts load back onto the diode, and then you close this switch. So you start rebuilding that magnetic field. Right? So after a short period of time, let's say it drops to 1.2 volts, right? So it's going to be like that, and I really screwed up the scales on this. Like, I'm having a hard time drawing this properly. So the scales on any of this are not going to be accurate. So we're going to pull back to 12 volts, you know? And that's going to quickly recharge, and then we're going to let it drop off again, and recharge, and drop off again. And we're just going to keep doing this over and over and over, and that's basically how a single phase VRM works. Lovely, and yeah. So basically, the entirety of a single phase VRM, or single phase buck converter, is that you have this switch right here, which charges and discharges this inductor. The charging and discharging of the inductor causes all of the voltage drop in like that's what converts your 12 volts into the lower voltage. Um, and then you have this part of the circuit down here to make sure that the inductor doesn't blow everything up because the inductor needs to keep pushing a current because if you just you know cut it off, then it's gonna try to dump all of its magnetic field energy into electric current which it can't produce because there's no closed circuit, so it's going to blow stuff up, which is why we have this part to make sure that there's a closed circuit available when the inductor starts to discharge. So this is a single phase VRM. Um, if you do a multi-phase, which thanks to my stupidly small graphs, this is going to be really, really hard to do. You know what? Screw it. I'm not going to use my stupidly small graphs. Uh, I'm going to draw a new graph and a new circuit. Yay! And actually I have to draw a new circuit anyway because that's all scribbled over. Uh, so we have our 12 volts again. This time we're going to do a two-phase VRM. And basically from a two-phase to a three-phase to a four-phase to a five to a six to a seven to an eight, uh, the scaling is the same. Like, th the way they're all implemented is the same. All of the multi-phase designs, they work the same way. They have rough, the benefits of the multi-phase designs are also roughly linear. Um, not quite. Um, but basically if you, you know, if you have two phases, they're twice as good as one phase. Three phases are 50% better than two phases, because that's 50% more, fa more phases. If you have four phases, that's 33% better than three phases. You get the idea. It basically scales right up. So I'll just explain on two phases, and you know that, that'll work nicely. So if we have two phases, then what you end up with looks like this. Essentially get two switches. Actually, I'm going to stop drawing those bubbles on those switches because that, that's, that's also a pain. So you get two switches, and that inductor is gorgeous. There we go. That's better. And you get two inductors, 
and those will combine like so. That goes into your load right here, so that would be your CPU. And then that goes off to ground as usual. And then you also get the extra circuits that have to be present like that. So you're going to get this one, and you're going to get, and I, I ran out of margin up there. I, I'm, I'm very good at this. Truly a professional. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's going to look like that. Basically, what this does, and I'm just going to draw this like that. I'm, yeah, less lines is better. There. Now, they're light emitting diodes, whatever. So basically, what you achieve with this um, is those inductors still have this same charging profile, except we can overlay it. So if I say this inductor is red and this one's blue, then we have the red graph right here. So the blue one would follow something like, I'm going to try draw it right on top of it, would do something like that through the blue one. And you get something, so basically it literally just doubles the amount of voltage. And that means that your distance between the, this valley right here and the, the peak of the voltage there is lower because your new valley is right there where these intersect. That's the minimum voltage that your CPU is going to see. The inductors are going to drop below that, but when that happens, the other one takes over. So you're never, you're basically your voltage is going to be more stable because you have two uh, phases. It also splits the current load because if you can see, we're still generating the same 1.2 volts. The CPU is not going to start demanding more power just because there's two phases, right? The CPU still demands the same amount of current. So if we say the CPU wanted 100 amps here, um, let me zoom in, lower my sensitivity. If we wanted 100 amps here, right, then we were putting 100 amps through that switch and 100 amps through this component, this component set right here every single time. And that would have to flow and then like that. And you get the idea. It, it would have to flow through that whole circuit. Here, we still want 100 amps because the CPU is still 120 watt CPU with a 1.2 volts uh, voltage, operating voltage. Except uh, we can run current through this phase and this phase at the same time. Because this one is going to be discharging while this one is going to be charging. So this one's going to be getting a bigger magnetic field. This one's magnetic field is going to be shrinking. And so we can push cur more current through the whole system. So you'll have 50 amps going through the top phase, roughly. Okay, It won't actually be 50 because the, the current roughly follows this pattern as well, uh, assuming that the CPU doesn't actually change its current demands, which CPUs do, which is why we have so many capacitors everywhere. Um, and assuming your current demand doesn't change, your current's going to follow this same pattern. So what's actually going to happen is at one point, this phase would be at, say, 60, and this one would be doing 40 as it discharges. So this one might be reaching the, you know, the minimum of its charge level, so it's going to hit 40. This one is maxed out on its charging, so it's doing 60. And they sw then they swap over, start discharging, and on average, each phase is going to be seeing about 50 amps of current going through it. And you know, you get your you get your tighter vol voltage tolerance. Um, you can use weaker components because each of them is currently, like, effectively, they're handling half the load, right? Half the current is going through each of them. And you're getting better voltage quality. I mean, what is not to like? You also put less strain on your PSU because it doesn't have to see a 100, current, 100 amp current spike. It sees a 50 amp current spike. And actually, your PSU doesn't see, uh, like, nobody would actually build this. There would be a few extra components right here on this line right here, but I'm not going to add them because they're just extra complexity for no reason. So those would be there to actually prevent that, you know, 100 amp current spike every time this, this switch, this switch closes. So then that's how these things work. Uh, now let's go over what they're named. And in a future video, I will explain uh, what all the components are called. And in a future video, I will explain how these things fail. Uh, and uh, we're going to go over how what everything is named because I forgot to do that earlier in the video. Sorry. Nah. So if we look at this, then, you know, th this is our single phase VRM. Uh, we have 12 volts there. We have ground here. 
So that's our choke inductor. This right here is the high side MOSFET. And it's called the high side MOSFET because it's switching on and off this high voltage, this 12 volts. And that actually causes a lot of load on the MOSFET. Okay, this high voltage is actually a huge part of why you can't just say the high uh, uh, why some things are not quite as they seem as I'll explain in the video where I'll explain why VRMs fail and how they fail and basically how MOSFETs blow up. So if you ever design anything with MOSFETs, you'll know what, what kind of stresses you can and can't put them under. This one right here is called the low side MOSFET because there's only two MOSFETs and um, this one's called the high side and everybody knows the other one has to be called the low side. Well, this one's called the low side FET because it switches on the low, uh, switches off the low voltage because effectively the voltage right here right before this this switch right here should be about zero volts all the time it's not actually going to be that because this diode is going to have some voltage drop across it while this switch is open but in general it should be about zero volts so that's why we call it the low side fet because it switches on the very very low voltages this one switches on the high voltage so yeah uh that's how VRMs work. Um, and in another episode, I will cover how they fail, um, where we'll basically just cover how MOSFETs fail, as well as an equation for calculating them in a switching scenario, because as you can tell from this explanation, they're not turned on all the time. They're not conducting current all the time. Uh, if you actually look at this graph, then the low side FET takes care of this. That goes through the low, and this goes through the high. So the high side fat has to deal with basically this. The low side fat has to deal with this. This current graph is hor this right here is horrific in terms of being drawn. Uh, a proper 1.2 volt, uh, like if I was actually trying to make it 1.2 volts, it should look something like like this, because you're going to be running a 10% PWM signal. But unfortunately, I'm not good enough at drawing, and I'm not going to redo this video because I'll screw up some other part of the video. So, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so basically, this is what a proper 1.2 volts would look like. This right here would more like give you 6, um, because this is roughly, like, this gap here is roughly the same size as the gap between the... Ugh, it's getting messy again. But, like, this gap, like this time period here is roughly the same as this time period here. So that would give you about six volts, what I drew right here. Uh, this first being really, really long, that's normal. That, that's actually how it works because you have to first charge up the inductors to that starting voltage. And then you can start re, you know, discharging them a bit, recharging them a bit, discharging them a bit, recharging them a bit. Um, so yeah. So that's correct, but this spacing is not going to give you 1.2 volts. This would probably uh, give you 1.2 volts, and this is called a PWM signal, which stands for pulse width modulation, because this right here is a pulse. Well, this is a, that is a pulse, um, and it has a width, and we modulate that width to generate different voltages. So if this pulse was like, say, this big, um, then it would give you a higher voltage than if it was smaller. So. Yeah, that just about covers everything you need to know about VRMs. If you think I did a terrible job of explaining how VRMs work, there is a dislike button for you to uh, abuse and a comment section where you can call me stupid and whatever the hell else you want to do. Uh, you can also be more productive, dislike the video, and ask me questions about anything I explained wrongly or nag me about making a better version of this video. In which case, I would appreciate if you actually funded the making of a better video by p potentially visiting my Patreon, subscribing to the channel, that does help, and sharing my videos. Yes, that too does help, uh, you know, pr get more videos done, because more views, you, you get the idea. You get how this YouTube get, get works, I bet. So, yeah, if you could do all of those things, that would be great. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you got educated, probably didn't get entertained, and see you guys next time.